Hey, 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 everybody, what's up? Welcome to episode number three, season two of the Epicenter. Um, this is an in-depth series where we talk to tech leaders and people who are shaping the industry of today's digital economy. Um, if you want to check out our previous episodes, please go to www number one epicenter.com that's one epicenter so without further ado i want to bring on the set um china's unapologetic truth teller <laughs> the one and only josh gardner what's up josh hey how you doing ronan thank you for having me big introduction here with a big smile so hopefully it won't disappoint uh yeah it's uh it's getting late here, so I'm glad we're doing this now. Another hour, I'm not sure I'd be in good shape. <laughs> yeah, well, we tried to make sure that we're going to capture most of the global audience. Um, you know, yeah. New York should be popping online and, and stuff like that. But Josh, for, for people all around the world who don't know what Kung Fu Data does, give us like the uh, 30, 60 second elevator pitch. 30, 60 second elevator pitch. All right, well, we'll do it this way. Our mission is to help brands thrive in digital China. And we do that a number of ways, but the biggest thing we do is we launch and operate brands on China's marketplaces. So we are a Tmall and JD partner, also a Douyin partner, and we also operate shops in VIP. So we have 27 stores and 15 brands and staff in both Beijing and Shanghai, pretty decent sized offices. And uh, we do it soup to nuts, everything from activ activation, uh, commercial operations, live stream commerce, studio, creative, you name it. So if it's, if it's going to relate to a sale and a brand building activity online, we usually are involved with our clients. So that's our role. And uh, it can be fun and also stressful, as we all know. <laughs> China is a pretty crazy place. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing place, the pace at which stuff moves and and. I mean, let's jump into this, like the, the current state of play in, in China's tech ecosystem has been absolutely on fire, right? Um, yeah. How would you describe it, you know, what you've seen over the past uh, uh, months? You know, it's funny, we just did a, a post, like a, a piece, a content piece, because we had a client ask us for a 10 year sales projection. And, <laughs> you know, like, you know, when you're in China, like even like two months is hard to do and be accurate, right? But, you know, the standard is we might give three years, you know, never go to five years. I mean, that's just crazy talk, right? I mean, and then when we saw 10 years, we said, you know, we got to respond to this question a different way. I don't even know how, because the basis for giving the projections is, of course, tied to the work you're doing in channels. And, you know, the things you're doing, the tools you're using and the channels you're working in. And we looked and not a single one of the things we did for this client, what we were doing for this client, actually yeah. existed 10 years ago. <laughs> so we said, it's just impossible. So the state of the ecosystem, basically my entire workflow from when I get up in the morning until I end did not exist. All the things we use to move the needle for people in China just didn't exist 10 years ago. So to give you an idea, it's moving so fast that, you know, it's like the future is being, uh, is collapsing into the present to use like a, a Bruce Sterling sort of uh, predictive ethnography of the human race. China's kind of designing the future as it goes and just dropping it into the present. So, you know, next year, who knows what's going to happen? I don't even know what I'm going to be doing. And it's, it's crazy. And when you look at the dates on, um, some of these platforms, like when this new technology was released or what we're doing now in terms of workflows and stuff, it's not that long ago. <laughs> it's like five years or three or two or one. And you're like, what? I mean, really it's happening so fast. We don't even know. We just, it's, that's normal. Just like, oh, some radical new tech transformation we have to adapt in the next 30 days because all the clients now want it. Yep. Or Alibaba says, yep, you guys are going to do it if you want to go to the event. And so every year, you know, like 1111, such a big showcase of the ecosystems moving the world forward, right? So you're right. just expected, my whole team, 80 people, they're just expected to adapt, right? You, you don't have a choice. You are you operating the environment. You basically just move forward or you don't go to the event, right? If you're not doing all these things, you're not going to be successful. 
So basically, it's it's this radical acceptance and just, uh, you know, see what happens with it, right? It's experimentation, it's radical acceptance, a bit of humility, a lot of respect. And, and I think this openness to learning is quite important in this ecosystem. And so the tech is changing constantly. And mm -hmm. uh, later in this interview, there's going to be some stuff we talk about how dramatic changes are. Um, but what I would say, the current state of play, because that's a very specific question, and I loved it, and I thought about it, and I came up with a response. China, in general, this tech ecosystem is using its scale and massive war chest, right, from that scale right. to break new ground in everything. And that's exactly what's happening. So essentially, they're just like creating whole new categories of trade and stuff. Like this year, I couldn't believe it. Like Alibaba launched a digital IP licensing marketplace. So let's say you're a factory in China or somewhere else and you 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 need an IP, right? You need like Disney or whatever it is. You can go to this marketplace and actually s transact almost like a matchmaking service. You can get your IP and attach it to a collection or whatever you're doing and launch it in their platform. I mean, so like, like unbelievable, right? That didn't exist two months ago, right? Uh, and, yeah. and this is the stuff that's happening now. It's it's wild. Uh, every day it's something. I don't even know what to say. It's really it is so wild. And I'm sure, I'm sure if you were to, to look back at like some of your decks from like, uh, or what you've posted like, three, six months ago, you'd be like, oh, that that's no longer relevant, right? And and it does move so fast. Oh, um, we, we had someone recently correct us. Like my, uh, the person who does our editorial, right? Our, our yeah. market our content, uh, content and editorial publisher. You know, she, she re-ran a piece that was very successful like last year. And all, like a whole bunch of people chimed in and said, this isn't even relevant anymore, blah, 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 <laughs> blah. And I looked at it and I said, Kai, you can't run that piece. I told you this stuff's, doesn't matter anymore it's not relevant so that's you're right i mean it's like the, the news is news for a day New, news for a day and speaking about news for the day right um with all these changes going on right there's got to be winners and losers and and let's not you know shout out company names or, or brands but what verticals do you think have have um been impacted or specific personas from some some of these these more seismic uh, shifts that have been going on in in the regulatory world right now. So that's actually I took your question a different way. I didn't want to uh, get into the regulatory side because I thought it was more interesting to say, all right, let's not pick on anybody, right? Let's, let's not, not pick on anybody. We don't want to do that. Let's not. F who's a winner and a loser? Actually, right. I created categories in my mind of businesses or the okay. way of doing things. Okay. So winners, people who are in live broadcast businesses like commerce, right? Because it's so now legalized. Right. So if you're doing live commerce or live engagement, you're winning because the tools and the tech are so sophisticated and effective. You're just blowing away the static people. So the losers are people doing static commerce or mm -hmm. static trade, traditional, you know, turning the wheels. Not that that doesn't have its place, but it is now, you can't really scale anymore or grow to another level unless you've added live. And and that's true in my world, right? So in, in for example, in the Taobao ecosystem, as an example, or Tmall, you can no longer not have live commerce. And the right. reason is they've now put an icon <laughs> on every product listing in store. So anytime someone goes in the app, there's a little flash says whether you're on air or off air, live or dead, right? So it's kind of like, hey guys, you're going this way, right? It's like do or die. So I think that's the thing. And you see that everywhere across digital ecosystem. There's the live sort of approach, this live real-time engagement, uh, whether it's in the form of short form video, it doesn't matter. It's this live entertainment of some kind embedded into your business or you're static and you're kind of sitting in time and the static is losing. It's Huge. like everyone had to become a QVC in your pocket, right? Yeah. And <laughs> then the next thing I see is the connected organizations versus the siloed. So mm -hmm. people who are sitting in silos in these sort of weird ecosystems, uh, they're not going anywhere well. 
right? Because they're not integrating enough of this technology into their businesses to keep consumers, right, are moving very fast. It's like a giant swarm, right? It's a huge village of fish, right? It's, think of it in an ocean, this fish. Just the young youth culture is 450 million people, right? They are very powerful, right? They, they're tr trillions in business, right? Moving around that money. And wherever they move, you need to be there. You're not going to catch any fish, right? I mean, the fi and the fish move fast. So what's happening is, right, people are staying still. Right in their silos, they're working in sort of a certain channel or a way they're doing. It. They're not connected enough to where things are moving, mm -hmm. and to me, that's like just being open and and actually setting your organization to just absorb all of it because you don't know what horse to bet on, so you just do them all. Right? It's kind of like you do them all and you see where the waves are moving. So you want to be in the path of growth. So again, organizations that are in the path of growth, which are connected organizations very deeply connected to their consumers in real time have an advantage and are doing much better than siloed organizations or people working at a distance. And then the last one I had for you was and, and the by the way, oh, go ahead. on that one, like think of like as, if you're a marketer in China, you custom your message according to what you're seeing, what people are talking about. You have to be able to craft that and turn it out into the market within hours, right? Oh but they're, how they're hours. speaking about you. Uh, hours? Minutes. Hours. Min oh. Minutes. Minutes. That is the pace, isn't it? And the yeah, third during, one. During time. events, it's minutes. During events, it's minutes. During normal day, yeah, maybe a couple hours. But you got to move fast, very fast. Yeah, customer service is real time in China. Real live oh, human yeah. beings, assisted shopping. So just that apparatus would scare everyone in Amazon, right? I mean, we, we have a, <laughs> half my team is involved with customer service and design, right? Because it's just so asset heavy and labor intensive. So I think that part is is big. And then the last point I had on this and the winners and losers is the future fit versus those living in the past, right? And that's something anyone can just imagine. And I think what, what separates a lot of companies in China, especially local companies versus foreign companies, you know, doing things the way they always did, uh, or even old industries in China, like the slow China, like the old industrial China. The big difference is the future fit ones, the, the, the people that are really kind of thinking through what's going to happen to them and making that change are going to win and, and are winning. And the ones holding on to the past or an old model aren't. So a great example in, in a B2B space is um, people that build bridges and tunnels. Mm -hmm. So China is ahead of, let's say, there's a company that's big in Germany that does this. It's a very capital intensive industry, right? Engineering. But the actual ODMs in China now are fully robotic. So they've already adopted AI at scale. And so they're so much more competitive, both from the ability to execute at speed and build a tunnel faster, but more importantly, they can do it better and more accurately and cheaper. So, I mean, that's a pretty thing. Like they future fit their productive capacity to a world that really hasn't jumped on this like um, AI the way we thought it would already, right? It, right. It's, but they're already future fit. And then, the, you know, their competitors overseas are just moving too slow. And so that's really what it's all about. It's your speed. So the future fitting is about being able to move faster when the time's right and preparing for it, investing heavily in it, right? Mm -hmm. Versus someone sitting on their laurels and just kind of riding what comes in and hoping they can adapt quick enough. And so I think that's a pretty good guide. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't name names, but it's not appropriate anyway. Well, well we, don't want to, we, we don't want to name names because that's yeah. not what this is about. But um, I do want to name something, right? And, and this is what you, right. you actually recently wrote like this. I mean, I can't think of a better analogy, right? From, from walled gardens to public parks. And you know, you came out with this piece and you talked about the recent updates, uh, uh, the, the, you know, in government regulation and big tech. How do you think this is going to impact the overall marketplace? Like, and, and that's through both a domestic and a global lens. Yeah, I think um, this is a, a what the Chinese government is doing, I think, is radical. Right. You mm -hmm. would in a capitalist economy, you would never do this. In fact, 
the tolerance for monopolies is extremely high. So if you look at like, let's take the US, Canada, England, et cetera, most of Europe, right? If you look at those countries and you look at any category, it doesn't matter what it is, no more than five players control most of the category. In a lot of them, it's really like two, three. And so there's near monopolies in almost every business in the US. And people just talk. Yeah. And so, but China has, you know, she and his team, you know, they've got a different view. Now, they obviously always have their own ulterior motives, control, right? Reining in certain things. But the other side of it is they're actually quite serious about this common prosperity thing, right? And so they have decided that no one individual or group of individuals should control so many resources, which I think, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, you know, they've basically disassembled a lot of these big conglomerates that have sprung up in the last 10 years and said, you know, you guys, you know, you think you're this and that you make one comment about us, like Jack, why you go to jail and whatever, we're going to take half of your business and sell it off. Right. So I guess they're saying, Hey, you guys have extracted a lot out of this system. It's time for you to give back. And in the way they want you to give back. Now that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but I think the idea of like, taking away captive ecosystems, right? So mm-hmm. not allowing people to hoard value, right? In in one place and extract it and force people to do things, I think is pretty cool. I gotta be honest, like you usually feel like a digital hostage, right? Not just in China, but outside China. This is true everywhere, right? That there are digital ecosystems. They tend to keep you stuck inside, right? Um, I think what they've done is it's going to have a huge impact. I mean, basically all the little guys are going to benefit. Merchants, brands, consumers, uh, small businesses. It's going to spark a lot of innovation, which doesn't exist now or is being pioneered by the big platforms themselves. So you think about like, this is your giant landlord, right? Mm-hmm. Who up until now has been a good landlord, right? But in the end, if it ends up like Hong Kong, right? It's going to stagnate everything, right? It's going to stifle. It's going to become so expensive to operate or take chances and risks. You know, it's going to cause a problem, in other words, in terms of innovation and force a new category to be created. So the government said, no, this is public property. Everyone has a right to it. And I can tell you right now, what I've seen is fabulous. I mean, the mashups are already happening. You know, affiliate links are all over the place. Uh, We're moving, we can see traffic we couldn't before. It's going to allow a level of monitoring and tracking in terms of our own investments and activities and really be able to be more efficient in how we market and grow a brand in China, as well as, you know, consumers, it's easier for them to navigate and get around. So I think all in all, it's going to be quite an awesome thing for the people that rent space, right? So almost like the tenants, so before it's the platforms, the landlords that control everything. Now it's really the tenants because the big landlord came in and said, no, 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 guys, that, that, that was really a lease, right? You didn't own that. <laughs> so I think that concept, I'm not sure, but I think anti-monopoly laws outside China don't really or haven't been enforced, but they're actually enforcing them. And it's nice to see because I think if we did that in the West in certain situations, I think we'd be happier. You'd have more choice. You'd right. actually have more options. You'd have a better life. You'd have lower costs and whatever it is that, that breaking up those monopolies does. So I think it's something we should consider as a race, right? As, as a human race, right? Like maybe it's not a good idea to allow this much control or hoarding in the hands of very few. And maybe it is time to, you know, mix it up a bit. Let everyone hack it out. You know, and that's what I'm seeing now is like the growth hacking going on, right? Now they're not blocked, right? We can do new things. Yeah. So it's cool. That part's I, cool. Yeah, I think it, it, it's it's definitely fabulous. I mean, if you're sitting in China and you're operating and you're a Chinese company, you're, you know, you've almost been handed like a golden opportunity into the market. And if you're outside of China and you're looking in and, and you're trying to interpret this, it's just so like so much to grasp and so much to try to understand. And, and I don't think most companies understand how, how welcoming this is to any player, right? 
Yeah, I, I it's, think this it's is huge. Is you used to have to these guys would make it, you know, just a couple years ago. If you even thought about, I, all right, I'll give you an example. I can say okay. this has happened. So three years ago, when Pindor Door was starting to take a chunk out of Talbot, okay, right, Alibaba very subtly basically told all of its category management team that if anyone in a category starts thinking about Pindor Door, they better stop thinking about Tmall, right? And this, they had leverage on us. And one of my clients spited them, right? He's like, they can't tell us what to do. He launched his Pindor door store and literally, he was number one on Tmall, by the way, or number two. Uh, and always number one or number two. And literally overnight, half as much traffic, no events, punished for moving his trade over there. And literally he went from number one in category that year to number seven and then never recovered. And so I think those days are over. And we all felt that subtle leverage that they had on us. And you had to be mm -hmm. going and very careful. And already we're getting well treated now, right? So it's like, you know, guys, I'm not so keen. You don't give me this entrance. We'll just go over to Jay. We'll just go over here. We'll just put our money over here. You know, we don't need to do it there. We can do it here. So that, that leverage is now better for the average operator. Uh, what I would say is if you're an average actor in the ecosystem, your experience is already better, right? Mm -hmm. what, think about it. Let's say you don't want to use Alipay, Drifflebox, right? Let's say you want to use WeChat Pay. Well, now you can everywhere, right? And, and the same with Alipay, right? Nothing's blocking. You don't have to have two different things, right? You can use whatever wallet you want. You can go anywhere you want, unblocked, right? And as a merchant, I can see you come. I know where you're coming from. I can check the quality of it. I mean, it's really interesting. And I think because it's open, they can't block each other. There's going to be a layer of innovation. So think of these platforms the way they are now, these ecosystems, as the hardware. And now someone's going to come in and develop software. And that's what's going to be interesting. All different kinds of layers of innovation are going to come on top of these big infrastructure players. You know, the digital infrastructure owners are going to be in place. They're still going to be there but there's going to be layers above them now and they can't stop it. They can't block it. They can't absorb it. And I'm like, Oh, that's going to be really cool. Like for anyone. And I think that's going to make their ecosystem again, faster moving, more competitive, more innovative and more interesting. So I think we're going to see even more stuff come out of China in the next few years than, than normal. Right. Because now they're more. Free. Yeah. I think it's like almost like, what a difference a day makes, right? And as soon as this yeah. uh, this came down, it's like everything had to open up and, and you see how long it takes something uh, like in the US, for example, if you look at the Epic and Apple case, right? Just to get like payments to be open outside of the closed ecosystem, right? It, it, it's just, you know, in China, it happens in a day, right? So this is, this is, I think it's just mind blowing how fast things move. And and on that note, I mean, if you are a foreign company, right? And I've and I'm sure you've seen many make and break in China and 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 come and go and get their pants uh, burned, right? Um, like, what do you tell a foreign company? Like, wh like, what's the one thing you tell them if if you want them to be successful in China? Wh what's the piece of advice that you give? Get serious. Only? get serious, get smart, and get going. Don't mess around. What I see is the single biggest mistake. There's so many, but it all comes from these things. Lazy, arrogant, dismissive, careless, or casual in their approach to China. Here's the opposite. I have a German client. I was on the phone with his executive team. These are amazing people, right? They are so thoughtful and detailed in how they approach the market, right? And I said, you know what I admire most about you guys? Your commitment, your humility, and your ability to absorb and take feedback, right? And, and it makes them so much more competitive than my average client. Just those things, just that humility and respect for China, knowing you're in a place there's 65 million merchants. There's 100 million e-commerce stores that are live. The population of Germany basically running an e-commerce store, all of them, right? And they know that. And they're just 
respectful. They, they have respect. And so what I tell people is you really just need to be humble, open-minded, and respectful. And I think if you actually can focus on that, what happens first? You know right away, wow, this place is different. You're going to really think about your model coming in, right? You're not going to say, oh, we're going to use what we use in other markets. You're not going to do that, right? You're no. going to radically accept what's in front of you and realize you won't dismiss it or be arrogant and think you have a better way because actually China is writing the future right now. Right? The playbook is in China. It's not in America. It's not in Europe. That's very far behind in my view. So it's interesting. The people, that is the defining feature. So let's say you weren't lazy and you had respect. What would you do first? You'd register your IP all the way through, not your foreign IP. You'd make sure your IP was registered in Chinese and English in China, local Chinese trademark. Now that's the kind of commitment I mean. That's what's getting serious is. You own the chain of IP. The ownership is a clear chain. So I probably once a month, at least have companies that have lost control of their IP in China. So they launch cross border, yip de doo da you build the sales up for someone in China that owns your trademark. So you built it up and they get to keep it. There's nothing you can do about it. So it's that, that's what I mean. Like get serious, get smart. China's big, right? And then get going. Don't waste time. Don't, don't sit on it. I have clients from parts of Europe, we won't mention the countries, that are so slow that I have to literally, like, they'll come back after six months or nine months like, hey, we're ready. I'm like, nope, got to redo the proposal. Got to redo the projections. Got to redo everything. Actually, the whole strategy's changed since then. Your category shifted. No one's doing that anymore. Now they're doing this. You know, and they're like, whoa. I'm like, guys, you just don't, you missed it. You don't get it. You got to move, right? So that's, yeah. those are the things. And um, if for, for basic advice, like what do they need to succeed? It's actually very simple. It really is simple. Establish brand provenance, I mean that very specifically, right. in the daily lives of consumers and defend it at all costs. So if you've really established your brand's provenance, it means you're investing in it daily, right? You're serious about it and you're putting the right money in and you're doing it in a way that resonates in China so you have brand strength. And then you defend that at all costs, meaning you own all the IP, you have the proper investments and structures in place to make sure you can control it. And that's really the difference between success and failure. And that's true now. It's going to be true in five years. It's not going to matter what channels we use, what tools we have, tips, tricks, track tactics. They're all going to change. They change overnight. Yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, August, I couldn't have a link for my affiliate. I have my Taobao Ke link affiliate program with influencers now running directly from WeChat groups and private accounts directly into Alibaba. I couldn't do that 60 days ago. I mean, it just couldn't be done, right? So this is why I tell people, serious, smart, fast. That's it. That's all you need to be and you'll do well and be respectful and, and you will do well. You'll be smart and, you, and you'll do things right. That, that's awesome. And, and I know you, you talked about a client asking for a 10 year uh, uh, forecast on, on what the business is going to look like. What's your forecast for the next 12 months? If you can even go that far ahead, what does the China tech ecosystem look like for you? So right now, what I think is going to happen um, is that the algorithms are going to be smart enough to order their own stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean that, like, I think, the supply chain's about to be radically disrupted in a real way. I think the algorithms are that smart. They may be replacing us soon, really, honestly. Like, possible, not sure that's part of Xi Jinping's job plan. So I think they won't automate the parts of the business that human beings have to operate intentionally. They're going to keep people working, right? Um, yeah. But the, the algorithm... The algorithms are going to be smart enough to run the show without human input, in my view. I think it's happening, or I should say, it may have even happened. And I'm, I, I, so there are some divisions of Alibaba that do this, where they actually have enough intelligence on their own sort of data forecasting within their own, because they have so much purchase intent data that their algorithms know what products they want to sell and color, shape, size, and data, and they can automatically contract to factories integrated into their system and have whole collections and brands produced overnight. So that's that's where things are moving right now. And a great example of that outside China for people listening is Xi'in, 
which to us is basically like that model is just basically like a, a, an everyday experience for a consumer in China. But they've said, wow, none of this is outside China. So they created their own ecosystem that merges uh, TikTok and Alibaba and all, all of it into one place, along with the predictive analytics and machine learning. And they've really pioneered a new business model called real-time retail. But that's wow. happening in China now. So it's happening all over. And I think that's why I'm saying the algorithms are now smart enough to do their own stuff. They don't need that. That would be the most immediate forecast, I think, that elevation of intelligence. That that is super cool, and and uh, I know we're running up on time here, Josh. But uh, I can't let you go without doing a quick rapid fire because that's one of my favorite parts of this, uh, <laughs> this series. Are you down with it? Sure, go for All it. All right. So if you weren't China's truth teller, what would you be doing right now? Oh, you know I can't stand these questions. Okay, so no telling, honestly. Um, I, I think, won't tell anyone. I promise. No, no. I mean, I I don't know, right? Uh, no. I thought about that really hard. I was like, do I have a plan B? All right. So I guess so. I, I've been thinking because I have children, I have teenagers. Uh, and I went to Singularity University a few years ago. And it really blew me away. All these problems, big problems we have with food and energy and water and pollution, resource depletion, extractive business models and bad governance. And we've all seen how horrible that's been the last two years with right. COVID. Right? And um so I, you know, I've been thinking about it a while, like conservation technology. So like, for example, making an individual home energy independent, right? Um, a lot of stuff like this. Um, and I don't know what I would go in, but things like this, vertical farming, all this kind of stuff or help fix the ocean. I don't know. But I think if I, if I, if I'm blessed enough to exit well at some point uh, from my endeavors over here, I would leverage my relationships and my China part of me to do something more high-minded for the earth. Cause I got kids and I'm worried they're not gonna be able to drink water and stuff, you know? So this stuff freaks me out. And some of my friends have already gone this way. They sold their other business, whatever, and they've moved to something more high-minded and I admire them. I'm like, yep, I would love to be one of them, you know, do something like that in my next life. I'm there with you, man. So what, non-Chinese brand would you say has become the most successful brand in China? Oh, I mean, this is, it's obvious, Apple, right? You don't even need to look farther than that, right? What's your favorite comment? Uh, we're, we're doing rapid fire. So what's your favorite accommodation in the whole world? <laughs> uh, Rosewood at K11 here in Hong Kong is my f current favorite. It's beautiful, the new Rosewood, it's beautiful. That's awesome. I know who designed it too, Tony. Um, what's your favorite TV show or movie? Thought about that too. Uh, so I'm going back in time. I was thinking like, what was the movie that I had the most significance when I was in university? It was, I know this is kind of a sad thing, but the Shawshank Redemption struck oh, me. Best ever, favorite. isn't it? Yeah. What, and then what? TV show is uh i'll give you a recent one i watched with my son it just blew me away it was breaking bad i couldn't believe how good that was <laughs> and i didn't think it was gonna be good i hated it at first but i actually ended up really loving it i thought it was very well acted and written i i binge watched that don't tell anyone um yeah. you have your favorite what's your favorite book of all time that was quick henry miller tropic of cancer for sure and uh last question before i let you go What's your favorite food? Isn't that obvious? Chinese and Japanese. <laughs> I love Asian food, right? But Chinese and Japanese for sure. That's awesome. So this is a wrap. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope you got some great insights from Josh of Kung Fu Data. Thank you so much, Josh, for uh, being on the Epicenter. Thank you, Ronan. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Talk soon, man. Well, and stay safe. Take care. Yep. Cheers. Bye-bye.